Damon Lorenzo, Jeff in Vegas. What's up, guys? How's it going, Jeff in Vegas? Sweet background. Love it. Oh, thank you. How did you do it upright, man? We got to do this junket style today. There you go. Let's go. Nice. <laughs> well, thanks for joining me to talk about This is the Year. Uh, what a great coming of age film. I enjoyed it a lot. And, uh, you know, Lorenzo, you know, Josh is a typical teenager who falls for a girl. He, he can't get the courage to ask out. We've all been there, right? Uh, most popular girl in school. He sets his sights pretty high, doesn't he? He does. He does. He, uh, he, he goes after this girl that um, is his dream. And uh, you'll just have to watch it to find out what happens. <laughs> Absolutely. A lot happens. I'll tell you that. Uh, David, you know, this, this is the year has such an 80s feel to it. Very fast times at Ridgemont High, John Hughes, but it has its own identity. And I love how the colors pop in this movie. Almost every scene, everywhere you look, there's just colors everywhere. Yeah, it was uh, color theory is a big deal for me as a director. And, you know, I wanted to have a try to color palette where you had Molly in green, Zoe in red, and Josh kind of right in between there in this like yellowish kind of world. So lit literally the colors mean something all along the way in the film. Uh, the two girls are literally diametric opposites. But what's funny is we wanted to flip the tropes on its head of girls being catty. And they actually help one another throughout the way both girls come to harmonize throughout the film. And our, our female writer, Sienna Aquilini, did a great job bringing agency to those characters and flipping the tropes on its head. Even like you said, the hot girl um, in a lot of the 80s and 90s movies, she didn't get an arc or the pretty girl didn't get an arc. And so it was a, a big goal of mine and Sienna's to give her a real arc and show that on the surface, everything is not what it seems. There's a lot more going on there. And so we wanted to create a deeply layered and complex um, woman in Zoe and give her a really meaningful and powerful arc. And yes, like you said, the 80s were a big influence. I wanted to, to make a film that any age could sit and watch and get something out of. So while we primarily made it for, you know, middle schoolers and high schoolers, if their parents want to come watch or if anyone who's just sitting to wanting a good feel good movie would watch, they'll get something from it and they'll, they'll see something that they like and it'll feel familiar and warm uh, to them because the goal is to just make the movie feel timeless and give it a, a feel good um, tone all along the way. And Lorenzo and David, you can answer this too. Was there a girl that you can recall that when you came back from summer break or one year and she completely changed, I can think of three or four girls that just were nothing like I saw them, you know, at the beginning of summer. That's, that's, oh yeah, my entire oh, yeah. middle school and high school life. I felt like every girl just totally changed over summer and became a woman and I was the shortest kid and nothing changed about me, but the girls always changed. And so I felt like this little, little dweeb. Yeah, <laughs> in middle school, every summer, the girls would get taller and then the guys in high school, I was a late bloomer too. So the guys in high school would we get stayed a the same taller, size. So. <laughs> And, you know, Lorenzo, this is a road trip movie, and it's all based on a lie, not just any lie, a huge lie. Yes, yes, that is, the, I think that, uh, you know, that is sort of the inciting incident of Josh's character arc, is he, he has to stick to this lie, and then the series of events sort of unfolds. Um, but he says he has tickets to their favorite. Yeah, he says he has tickets to their favorite band, but he really doesn't. Um, so that's going to really clash against Josh, because Josh is a sincere guy. He is someone that tells the truth. You know, you can see that between him and his group of friends. Um, so for him to do that, it it, 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 it it plays to the themes of expectations versus reality that you can't lie. That is not reality. It is contrary to reality. So um, I think in the end, it really, uh, you know, proves Josh's character arc and, and shows that he's a better man. And David, you know, this is your directorial debut. Tell me about the first shot on the first day and what was your last shot on the last day? Oh, that's a great question. So the, the first shot, the assistant director, Doug Turner, who's a great assistant director, lined up the schedule to where it was very easy on the first day. We were in the basement of a movie theater. So when you shoot a movie, you utilize locations as much as you can. So we made a basement into a room so Mikey's bedroom is actually a basement in a movie theater. Um, and it was just a static shot of him on the phone. It was the scene where Lorenzo calls him and says, dude, guess what? Uh, I got tickets to this thing. You need to come with me. So it's the split screen shot where the two of them are talking on split screen. And so it was, it was static. It was nice and easy. We just had to light it well and get it done. But I had to make sure he was placed on the screen in a certain way to where if there was a split screen, it would look proper. And we had to do some head cues where on certain lines, his head turned 
So that way, when I shot Lorenzo, his head would also turn at the same time and the screen direction would be equal with both characters. So it was a little complicated in that sense, but it was an easy scene to shoot because it was just static, no complicated camera movements or anything. And it was so wonderful. I felt so good. Uh, at the end of the day, I remember we finished like two minutes ahead of schedule and I literally went, Whoo, man, we made it. You know, I felt like we, we, we got it done. It was a big deal. And then the last scene was um, with all of the, on, on the, on at the, the battleship, the it was dock. at the battleship and we we're on the dock and it was a race to the finish line. We had to get this one shot of characters walking away from the screen and literally like, shoot. it was a night shoot. It was like 5 a.m. The sun was coming yeah. up and uh, we got it, you know, barely. It was like, one more hurry, keep it rolling. And we just barely got it. We I think I slept it. four hours between two days during the last week. I was, we were up so late. We finished hard. Um, finished hard. Well, you know, without giving any spoilers away, you know, I always thought that he was chasing the wrong girl. Molly, his neighbor, he talks to through the second story window, works with him at the movie theater, goes back to sleep, Jared, go to sleep. I love that line in the theater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go you to know, sleep. But I, I, but I just thought, you know, her parents are even in Colombia. I'm like, this guy is such an idiot that he's chasing <laughs> the, the unattainable girl and his neighbor is there right next door. So I, I thought she was great. Who played Molly? Uh, was it Vanessa? Uh, Vanessa? Vanessa Morano, she's wonderful, so talented. She's been in the business forever. I really related to her because we both were child actors. We grew up in the industry. In fact, my first guest star was on Without a Trace when I was uh, like 10, nine or 10. And she was a series regular on that show. And she came in at the same time. So I've been in the same room with her since I was a little kid. And I had so much confidence in her because she had so much experience. Like when you're doing an independent film, time is the enemy. And when you're working with such a pro like Vanessa, she gets it and she gets it in one or two takes. She's incredible. She knows what she's doing. She understands how the camera works with the actor. She understands how lighting works. She understands blocking and how to hit a mark and everything uh, in, in a deep and fundamental way to where we don't lose any time yeah. on, on her. She nails it. She nails it in one or two takes. So having such a professional actor be there and be so endearing and sweet and caring and pull off a performance was incredible. She incredible. was she was helping me hit my marks. <laughs> you know, and I'm all for it. Right I, I, say, I was all for a grilled cheese truck, you know, because at yeah. one time in the last decade, I was going to do a cereal truck. I was going to start uh, just only serving cereal. So, That's but nice. and I've heard, you know, watching Shark Tank, you know, the guys who do grilled cheese trucks and, and uh, tomato soup. I mean, so the whole movie, I was craving a grilled cheese, you know. So oh, I know, I know, me too, <laughs> me too. I and also it. Selena Gomez, executive producer. What was it like working with her? Uh, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. You know, we, we've never done anything professional together since working on Wizards of Waverly Place because we always respect each other's friendship. First and foremost, we're friends and we're there for one another. But she saw this movie just as a friend and she was so, I think, impressed by the message and impressed by the tone and just a feel good movie. I think she very much senses how divided the world is and how um, almost sad uh, there is uh, how, how sad a lot of the world is right now because of COVID and being locked down and being unable to get out and go out there. She just loved how feel good and positive the movie she was. So I think she was impressed with the message, impressed with the feel good elements and really wanted to help uh, bring that together and take it to another level. So she jumped on as executive producer to help get the film out there and also gave some great creative notes along the way. Um, and we're, we're, we're super honored to have her on board helping the film. And I appreciate you kept it kind of family friendly too, because, you know, teen comedies can go real raunchy. They can go real adult, you know, and I noticed throughout the whole movie, I'm waiting for that to happen. And you didn't, you kept it, you know, something where anyone could enjoy it, you know? So that was Honestly, a great, I really hope like, a, you know, I feel like for tweens and teens, they don't have anything they can watch with their parents. So I hope this is a movie that they want to watch. And then they could also be like, Hey mom, dad, come watch it with me. And everyone enjoys it. Like, I hope this is a bonding experience. Um, but at the same time, it's timeless. So really anyone can sit down and watch it because it has a classic kind of feel to it. Well, guys, congratulations on a great film. And, you know, Lorenzo, I'm, I'm keeping my geek side contained right now because I'm a huge fear of the walking dead fan. And just seeing you right now, I'm like shaking because I'm, I love that show. And you're awesome, by the way. <laughs> I, I, I love Fear the Walking. That show was such a such a joy for me to be on. I, I loved every day of the job, like being a part of that cast, that platform, uh, the producers, the creators, the actors. I, I miss them dearly. And you never know, Chris might be out there somewhere. <laughs> and it's great to see two brothers working together. So hopefully you'll do another project together. Yes. Oh, we got we got a TV show coming out on Netflix called A Tale Dark and Grim. 
um, which is a Netflix animated show starring Adam Lambert and uh, Jonathan Banks and uh, Tom Hollander. Uh, it's, a, it's a really solid, Randy Rodriguez is in it. It's a really solid show, A Tale Dark and Grim on Netflix. So that's coming up next if you want to check it out. Oh, absolutely. We'll talk again soon about that, but come visit us in Let's Las Vegas. It, come come see us in Vegas. I, I'm, I'm down. I'm down. I love to gamble. <laughs> <laughs> Great, guys. Thanks again and good luck with the film. Thank you, brother. Cheers.